We are five weeks into a chaotic, injury-filled NFL season, so let's take a look at five moves to make heading into week six. At the start, move number one, we're adding all of the new backup running backs. That may seem weird, that may seem counterintuitive, but as these running backs keep going down, new players are now one step away from being relevant. I mean, just this week, right, we can now look at Tyler Goodson. He is the clear handcuff to Trey Sermon, who is the handcuff to Jonathan Taylor. In week five, he had 33% of the opportunities. He was the only other running back not named Trey Sermon to touch the ball. Tyler Goodson now has to be rostered, especially in your deep dynasty leagues, as running backs continue to go down. That This is important here. The same goes now for Miles Gaskin. And that's in a name I never thought I'd say again, but you probably don't even know where he's where he's rostered right now. He is in Minnesota with Aaron Jones leaving with a hip injury. And yes, they're on bye week, so maybe you don't have to add him right now. But if you have an open spot, Miles Gaskin is now the backup to Ty Chandler, right? It's him or CJ Ham, and I'm probably not gonna bet on a fullback. So Miles Gaskin is now the next next man up. And after that, Zach Moss leaves with an injury late in the fourth quarter in uh, Cincinnati. That means Travion Williams is now the handcuff or potential handcuff, I should say, to Chase Brown. So again, look, if you're starting Miles Gaskin and Travion Williams, you're down bad and things are terrible, but they have to be rostered because they can fill in in a pinch should something happen to the backup they're currently backing up. Now, move number two, you probably expected to hear this name. You didn't. We have to go out and add Dare Agumbawale. The reason I'm not lumping him in with the other backup running backs is there was a clear shift in role in week five. Dare Agumbawale easily, easily outplayed Cam Akers, and he also earned significantly more touches. You're talking 22 opportunities total, 15 carries to nine carries for Cam Akers, seven targets to three targets for Cam Akers. Also, keep in mind, like, that's an 18% target share. That is a fantastic role to keep in a high-volume offense. As long as Mixon and Pierce are out, Agumbe Wale has RB2 upside. It looked like this shift is permanent, or it should be permanent, because he just performed better than Cam Akers did at any point when he had the starting role for the last couple of weeks. So Agumbe Wale becomes a must-own running back, not only in Dynasty, but redraft as well. As long as these guys continue to not play, he has to be on a team. Now, away from the waiver wire moves, move number three, go send out offers for Brees Hall. It's very easy for us to overreact week by week. The last two weeks, specifically for Brees Hall, have been bad. They've been terrible. Let's just be honest, right? Ten and a half points combined over the last two weeks for what many people consider is either the best second or third best running back in the NFL for fantasy. This is disappointing. It's upsetting as someone who rosters Brees Hall in a lot of places. It's just not what I want, but the role is solid. The player is still incredible. I mean, this this touch of this talk of Braylon Allen stealing all the touches away and that, that's what's sinking his value. Brees Hall still had 65% of the opportunities last week. He's not dead. The, the offensive line just hasn't been good. Aaron Rodgers has not been good, and that's contributing a lot to Brees Hall not being good. The craziest stat I saw was weeks one through five of 2023. The Jets scored 94 points. In weeks one through five of 2024, the Jets scored 94 points. This offense has not improved. It's not taken the leap we thought it would with Aaron Rodgers, which in hindsight, I think relying on a 40-year-old quarterback off of an Achilles tear and expecting him to be great was probably stupid. But Brees Hall, the talent is there, and he's balled out in bad offenses before, just like last season. So I'm going to buy Brees Hall. And just, I know it's not redraft, but if you want to look at the end of the season, his last four weeks, Miami, Jacksonville, LA, Buffalo. Those are going to be fast-paced games for the most part against poor defenses for running backs. Brees Hall is going to find his stride, even if it's not until late in the season. He's going to be incredible. And as far as like what I'm giving up, I'm still giving up mid to early first round picks for Brees Hall. I'm giving up multiple late to mid firsts. You have to pay up because he's still Brees Hall. He's just not untouchable like he probably was a couple weeks back. And move number four, we are buying low on Tank Dell. 
Tank Dell has been bad, underwhelming, but mainly bad. Uh, he's also been injured, and like that doesn't help either when we're only five weeks into the season. Look, guys coming off of season-ending injuries typically start slow. They are not going to give you the best version of themselves immediately. On top of that, Tank Dell got shot this year. <laughs> like, he also got shot in the leg. He had a very difficult and probably traumatic offseason. I'm not surprised that Tank Dell has not hit the ground running. Again, we talked about Nico Collins as a better buy for contending teams, uh, Tank Dell for rebuilding teams. Admittedly, Nico Collins is just the better receiver to own, but Tank Dell is still good, and that's what we care about. His production as a rookie is next level. It was elite. That doesn't just happen on accident. And yes, they added Stefan Diggs, and yes, Nico Collins broke out, and those are probably limiting factors, but he is a hyper-talented player that just is not fully healthy. And I think that's the biggest issue. If Nico Collins misses any kind of time with this hamstring injury, you're probably going to see better production from Tank Dell. That's going to make him, you know, buying low on him feel a little bit better. But ultimately, I think you get the best version of Tank Dell next year. And right now, he can be had for a late first round pick place, you know, maybe a second or, you know, a, a producing veteran wide receiver. Those are the offers I've gotten or the offers I've gotten completed with Tank Dell. And to close it out, move number five, choose your path. And by that, I mean, you're five weeks in. You know if your team is good. You know if your team is bad. You know if it's in the middle. You need to dictate what the rest of your season looks like. If you are one and four or zero oh and five, start selling veterans. It's never too early. In a league where I'm just getting demolished, I sold J.K. Dobbins. I sold Matthew Stafford. I sold Jerome Ford. I am getting these guys off of my teams while they are healthy. I think it's helpful to move on from guys a little bit earlier in the season because injuries pop up. When players are healthy and they have value, I want them off my rosters for picks and younger players. If you're 4-1, and 5-0, and look at those cheap veterans. Admittedly, if I am a 4-1, four, 5-0 four and one, five and oh team, I'm not buying running backs because they go down often. I'll buy running backs like week 12, right before the playoffs when I know who's healthy. That's just a piece of strategy I think is useful. But if you're in this mode where you think you're a piece away and you're, you've you been winning a lot, this is the time to go and do it because teams are going to start to sell. And if you're somewhere in the middle, if you're three and two, two and three, be honest with yourself. Are you a real three and two? Should you really be in that position? If the answer is yes, and you've just had injuries and you've underperformed and you think you should be higher, go make a trade for a veteran. If you're three and two and your team is not actually good and you've gotten lucky, start selling because being in the middle with a bad team or an average team is the worst place to be in Dynasty. 